So, welcome to D&D School Homeroom, you brave four. Um, and those of you who I'm recording at home for, I guess, weird. Um, so, uh, we're here to talk about Dungeons and Dragons. And I'm very excited because I love Dungeons and Dragons. Also, uh, I used to be a teacher, I'm not a teacher anymore. So this is an opportunity to both relive and have like fever dream flashbacks from when I was a teacher. So if I start huddling and crying in the corner, you'll know what's happening. <laughs> That's happening. Uh, so the whole purpose of this first class is very much like a big overview for all of D&D school. And so for some of you that like have already experienced some stuff and played before, some of it's going to seem like no, no shit, Derek, we get it. <laughs> um, so, but some of you that have never played or have very little experience, it's going to, oh, okay. Um, so I apologize to you that this, some of this may seem boring or some of it that may seem esoteric. But I try to keep it as rule, like we're not getting into any gameplay specifics tonight. That's not what this is about, okay? Uh, as I said, my name is Derek. I'm <laughs> your teacher. Uh, just so you know kind of where I'm coming from, uh, my experience with uh, Dungeons and Dragons, I've played since I was in high school, and I've played lots of different games, lots of different systems, lots of year-spanning campaigns of wonder and excitement. Uh, but I will say right up front that I am not the world's greatest expert on the rules of anything, okay? Uh, for me, I always enjoy it a lot as a storytelling tool, and the rules part is secondary, like plugs into my video gamer happiness place, but for me it's always a storytelling thing. That's what I, when, I, the, when I played D&D in high school, I played D&D for like two years before I ever even used dice. It was purely just me and my friends saying, here's what happens, here's what I do. And the DM would be like, that sounds like that works. And we would play on the phone a lot, on landline phones, because there were dinosaurs and things like that. Um, so I am, I am not an expert on the rules of anything. I'm not an expert on anything. I'm just very <laughs> enthusiastic, and I have lots of experience. But basically, one of the, I had kind of three goals for this school. Uh, the first goal is I want to remove barriers to entry for new people. Like, I want more people in this pastime. Because it's awesome and it's fun and it's very cheap <laughs> if you want it to be. Or it can be as expensive as you want to be too, like any nerd pastime. Uh, but I want more people in the pastime, so I want to remove barriers to entry. Because I know lots of people who've never played, who I think would really, really love it, but there's lots, of, there's lots of things that feel like it's keeping you out, so I don't want to remove those. Uh, my second goal is to, um, write it down. Oh yeah, unlock the forgotten lore. Like, like all the things, like, because there is just stuff you need to know to be able to play games. Like I want to make that accessible to you and just like explain it as best I can. There'll be things that I'll be like, I don't know how that works. Because in any given D&D game, any, like anyone who's played with me as a dungeon master, they'll be like, like I do this, and I'll be like, how does that work? And we pull out the book and figure it out, and they're like, okay, cool. Um, but the third goal is to uh, remove the use of drow forever. <laughs> they're lame. You guys don't know what they are yet, but you're never going to, because they're lame and they suck. They're like elves, but dark and twisted. It's like a 1986 side of a van, silver hair. <laughs> Like, it's a very, like, uncomfortable, boring, terrible part of D&D's legacy, and it's time for it to just, just go away. Um, so that's, those are my three goals. Like, I just want to remove barriers of entry and make it easier for people to get in and just give you access to whatever information you need to have fun. But in the class, I'm going to talk a lot about Dungeons & Dragons, D&D, but I want to be real clear what I'm really talking about when I say that, because... As you may not know, there are many, many role-playing games. There are more than there are stars in the heavens. I've played my fair share. D&D uh, &D is kind of like Coke in the South. Even when we're not really drinking Coca-Cola, we ask for a Coke, and when we talk about soda pop, we say Coke, because it is the most common, most easy reference point. It's what most people think of when you're talking about D&D. &D. Like, so when I say D&D, &D, I'm, sometimes I'm, I am specifically talking about the game Dungeons & Dragons. But really, D&D is kind of like a catch-all term 
for all role play forever and ever. Amen. So that's so just so you're aware, it's kind of a catch-all term more than anything. And it's really fascinating to me, like anyone who hasn't ever done any sort of tabletop gaming of any kind, they really want to play D&D. Because like they want they want to kill a goblin. Like they know that's the deal. They know that's what's up. And they want to do it, and I want to help you do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, one of the things that I think is very, the, one of these barriers to entry is all of this stuff. Okay, there's dice, there's miniatures, there's grids, there's books of rules. This is a new edition of fifth, uh, this is the fifth edition, the fifth version of Dungeons and Dragons. <clears throat> Arguably the seventh or eighth, depending on how you want to split hairs. And because there's lots and lots of rules and things you have to know and time you have to spend with books and learning and crap like that. Um, I didn't actually drink the water. You didn't. <laughs> it's been a really long day. I work for a website. It was Cyber Monday today, so. Oh, no. uh, okay. So that's one of the first big, like, barriers. And so I really want you to kind of, like, at its root, all of this stuff is extraneous, okay, to what's actually fun about D&D. Like, at its root, it is like the oldest human, uh, originally I was calling it the oldest human art, and then I was like, no, we probably like painted, but before we did this, <laughs> we probably, but the idea of people gathering in a circle to tell a story is very, very primal to the human experience. The idea of sitting down and saying, okay, we're making up a story. And yes, maybe some of them became religions, maybe then some of them became myths, but the, the idea of humans sitting around telling a story to each other, that's super basic. Everyone's done it, you do it all the time, it is primal and basic. And the fun of, this, of a game that's based around storytelling is awesome. Because the idea being that you can sit around with your friends and make up a story that you are telling each other with agreed upon rules, admittedly. That's why the rules exist, just so every, because like any, any good story, you need danger, you need peril, you need uh, conflict, you need comp, you don't need combat, but you need conflict. And ultimately all this rulesy type stuff is just to adjudicate conflict in one way or another. Just does the hero or the, the whoever's in the main part of that scene, like. Do they succeed or do they fail? And if they succeed, how well do they succeed? Or do they fail, how, poor, how badly do they fail? And also, what, uh, as the gameplay goes more and more, like how, how many ways do they have to succeed? What tools do they have? And that's where, it, that's where it can get really intimidating because it's like, you start thinking it's like chess, like where you gotta know how every piece moves before you can do everything. So what I really wanna stress for all of this stuff is it's all it is, is you are gonna sit around and tell a story. And the way that it sort of functions is in any role-playing group is there's always two groups of people. There's gonna be the dragon master, if you want, or the dungeon master, or the storyteller, or the game master. Every different system has a different name for it. It's, it's basically whoever's sort of in charge of the story. And then you have all the players. And as a player, your job is you are going to create a character. And you're going to try to interact with the world and the story that the dungeon master comes up with you using that character. Like, all, and that's, like, and that's all that it is. Like, yeah, there's all this stuff that complicates it and makes it uh, a little dubious to get into it right off the bat, but it's really straightforward. Like, you're just, you're just empathizing with an, another version of yourself that you're creating live in front of other people. Now it's not intimidating again. Maybe I should walk back. <laughs> no, I'm gonna break. No, no, it, no, because it's cool. Like, because you're just telling a story, and there's no wrong answer. Like, you decide what your character does. Like, you just like you decide what kind of story you want to tell, what kind of character you want to be. Admittedly, like this is sort of getting more grand, but within the framework that the sort of the covenant of you and the storyteller, and everyone's agreed we're playing this kind of game. It's kind of gonna be like this, you know. But you have a lot of freedom. And just to tell a story. Any human can tell a story. And I think that's what keeps a lot of people out of this pastime is that, that getting, like, getting away from how basic it is. 
Like, yeah, there's lots of crap that tells you how well you did, but the story you want to tell is you can decide that with none of this. Like I said, I played D&D for like two years with none of this. And admittedly, it was in high school, so it was lots of like, you're in a town, and there's a hot babe, and, <laughs> well, I'm a werewolf. Is she freaked out that I'm a werewolf? No, she's into it. You know, like, <laughs> there was lots of that. And like I was a werewolf, and my friend was a ninja, or vice versa, <laughs> and we would get like attacked by some sort of mad scientist, and we'd always get taken out, we'd always get knocked out in the fight, and then we'd wake up, and we'd been like stitched together, <laughs> like into a ninja werewolf hybrid, and then the game, the, you know, and then we, and then we would sort of lumber around. But anyways, so yeah, that's dumb, but it's also kind of awesome, like that. Um, that like, like it's kind of awesome to have those sort of that sort of freedom to tell these dumb, dumb stories, and that's what's kind of cool about it because it's like there's as many stories as there are people, and so you can tell as many different kinds of stories as you want, have as many different characters as you want. Uh, this is kind of getting into other stuff too. I ramble a lot. If you all know this. I don't know what I'm talking about. You all know. I know all you personally. You know this. I ramble all the time. Do you think? I'm just gonna ramble. Um, so um, I lost my train of thought. No, uh, me and several friends who have role played a lot over the years, we have lots of characters that we've made over and over and over, had the sudden thought of, wouldn't it be horrifying if a psychologist <laughs> was handed a folder with every character you've ever made and was just le left to go make, draw what conclusions they would from that stack? Terrifying. <laughs> Terrifying. Um, and that kind of brings me to, oh, I'm sorry. I just realized I actually have this lesson plan that you guys can look at, so you can see how far I am in my rambling. <laughs> We're here. <laughs> Tales told by community. Yay. It's a good thing, and you can all do it, so don't, don't be afraid of it. The end. Okay. All right, so, and this is kind of a, this is kind of leading into the big section of what I want to talk about tonight. The rules and roles are what I really want to talk about. Like kind of the meat, like the closest we're going to get to actual firm data tonight. But the game versus Gilgamesh is people treat this, these games, very, very differently. To some people, it is just a game, like a video game or chess or checkers or anything like that. That's all it is. That's all they want it to be. And that's absolutely fine. Like, they want to know all the rules, they want to, know, they want to argue about the rules, they want to win based on the rules, all they want to do is win, and they want to get more loot, they want to kill more things, they want to get stronger, and most of these games are designed that way. Like, it's built around you doing things to get more experience points, to become more powerful, to be able to do more things, and get more things, get, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Skinner box on wheels kind of thing. Skinner box where you, with the rats push the button, it's a thing. Okay, sorry. Okay. <laughs> it's, a, it's a thing. It's a thing. It's a thing. Uh, but then on the opposite of the spectrum are people who view it just totally as a medium for storytelling. That's when you get into people who do like live action role play, who play systems that are very, very rules light. And then these exist. Like if you want to get into this, like and you this and you start learning more and more about the D and D system, and you're like, this is too complicated. There's lots of cool systems that are awesome that are very, very simple, like Fate and um, like Four Colors. And there's a whole, I can give you a whole list of them, but like you don't, this isn't the only, this is not the only portal into this, this lifestyle that I'm trying to <laughs> seduce you into. Like it doesn't have to be D&D. &D. There are other really like, there are other really cool, really flexible games because all the rules are is just a, like, some games are just as simple as flipping a coin. Like I want to do this. Flip coin, heads you did it, tails you didn't. The end, because that's all, because a lot of times, like, if people really want their, their games to be about stories and epics and conversations and really learning about characters and emotions and building relationships and poetry contests and all that kind of stuff, that's also great. And like, you can totally do that in the same pastime. I'm somewhere in the middle. <laughs> of that spectrum. I'm much more toward the storytelling aspect, but I also do like all the toy aspects of it. So just so you're aware of that. All right, so rules and roles, because that, that's kind of the big binary, because it's a role-playing game, but there's lots of rules. 
So let's kind of talk about just the ba very basic, here's who's at the table. You have the players, and you have what I call the dungeon master. Uh, as we're kind of talking about before, your duties as a player are much simpler <laughs> than the dungeon master. Your duty is to be on top of your character. Like, it obviously helps if you know how everyone else's character works, or how other things in the game work, but ultimately, if you can just keep track of your character, great, that is your only job. And, you, like, you are the one making all the decisions about, like, your character's backstory, and your character's, like, what they look like, their appearance. Uh, also, um, you have total control in what decisions you make. Like, there are some nefarious dungeon masters in the world who kind of build their games where they're leading you down a track, and then there's the moment where you're supposed to, like, say your lines, and they're going to lead you down to the next track. But ultimately, as the player, your job is to control your character. Like, you are the captain of that ship. That's just the way it works. Um, on the other side, you have the dungeon master. And they are the one that do all the work, and you fucking players <laughs> just don't appreciate it. You don't go along with the plan. You make jokes. You come in late. Ah, I'm terrible. We're terrible. Uh, but the dungeon master's job is basically to be up on all the rules. Like, that's their job. Uh, and their job is to write the story, present the story to you, hopefully make it fun and interesting. Uh, also to uh, perform, help you perform that story. Like keep people moving, like if the whole party is like... Because a lot of times, uh, the sort of the grand demon of this pastime is choice paralysis. You guys familiar with this? I know I talk about it all the time. Uh, but for those of you at home, no. uh, choice paralysis is basically when you're given too many choices and you can't decide what to do. Um, and so the DM can help that with like, all right, the party's just debating, this is a cool debate, it's been five minutes, they still haven't reached a decision, I'm gonna move them along. So we don't, don't sit here in this moment of unfun choice paralysis forever. Um, also their job should be, a good dungeon master, their job should be to help you tell the story you want to tell about your character. Like, they're just, like, basically, they want, they need to, I mean, you have to help them. It's definitely a partnership. They need to know that, like, your character wants to be the greatest swordsman in the land. And their job is to make that possible and then put obstacles that you have to surmount to reach that. Like, people that want to challenge you, your sword gets broken, you suddenly realize that you really love the loot instead, you know, just like whatever. But... Um, just to place obstacles in your way to help you tell that story. Um, and also their job is to... What is it? <laughs> of course it is. Come on in. Hey. Can I have a seat? Yeah, no worries. Sorry. We've already missed all, you've already missed all the good stuff. <laughs> uh, Sorry. We're basically talking about goblins now. Oh, goblins. Uh, so... Okay. Uh, we were just talking about, you missed all the cool stuff, <laughs> but now we're talking about just when you sit down to play Dungeons and Dragons, that you, there's basically two groups. You have the players and you have the dungeon master. The play, and if you're the player, your job is to be in charge of your character. If you're the dungeon master, your job is to be in charge of essentially everything else. To tell the story, but also their job is to work with you to tell the story you want to tell about your character. Like you would create, like if you have a goal, my job is to put obstacles between you and that goal. Because ultimately, like some, some people, like some stories, like I keep saying like some dungeon masters, like I'm like thinking of somebody. It's like I'm just imagining a bad dungeon master or a bad, it's really just a bad storyteller. Like if you're like, man, wouldn't it be cool if I, had, I was the greatest swordsman in the land? And you're like, you're the greatest swordsman in the land. The end, you win. Like that's not fun. Like that's not a good story. You don't just getting immediately what you want. That's not fun at all. Um, so, but really, what I was just about to get into is, I kind of already touched on it a little bit, but I'll kind of run through it real quick again, is the function of rules, uh, and I kind of already talked about this, the need of, the need for mastery or lack thereof, because one of the, this is for you, Michael, because you were late, and I'm going to go back over things, <laughs> now boring everybody. <laughs> uh, but one of my goals for this whole thing is to remove barriers to people getting into the game, and one of the big barriers are all the rules and all the stuff. 
And ultimately, all this is unnecessary. Okay, it's really just there to help you dis like, because every good story needs conflict, so you need a way to resolve conflict. Okay, the, a way for like, I want to I want to stab the goblin. Well, you missed, you know, or whatever, or you hit, or you hit it really well, you know. It's just a way to give you ways to resolve conflict and ways to have interesting ways to solve the problem. But they aren't always the same. Um, but the big thing I want to talk about is nerd fights. <laughs> and this is another thing that I think is a huge barrier to entry for people. Because there is a stereotype, and it's true, <laughs> of big sweaty dudes like me sitting around a table, arguing for hours, looking through different books, like, no, 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 it says right here that my uh, quiver ability, you know, like arguing about, like, no, the fireball radius is 30 feet, and clearly, I know you're around this corner, but if the, if the mirror wall reflects the heat, like, all these, like, these things, nerd fights are real, <laughs> they exist, and they're a huge barrier because they're awful, okay? And that's, and these tend to come up more in situations where people who are playing it just as a game, like, they're not really interested in telling a story, they just want to play a game. And games are about overcoming challenges and becoming more powerful, and that's what they're about. So of course the rules are very, very important in those. And when you, and you will be, when you start playing, you're gonna be amazed at how quickly you're going to care about whatever you, no, no, about whatever you make. Like your first character, your 10th character, whatever. Just because you made it, you're gonna care a little bit about it. Like when you make, uh, Muffin the Halfling Rogue. Like, you're going to be like, oh, Muffin. What's Muffin doing? Man, Muffin's in a tight scrape. Like, you, like, just because you were telling that story, you made that character, you care a little bit. And so when Muffin's in danger, and the way the rules work determines whether Muffin will live or die, or be permanently maimed, or win the love of Muffin's life, um, that becomes very important to you because you, and the more you play the character, especially like D&D &D campaigns can go on for years, which is another barrier. I know, don't freak out. No one freak out. No one freak out. Um, but you, you become invested because you're telling a story. You created that character. That character is like, you made a little piece of yourself. Um, and so, in, so you'll be surprised how much you immediately care about Muffin a little bit. You care about him now when I just made him up? <laughs> him or her? A gender muffin <laughs> being that I just created? You care just a little bit about muffin because, but just imagine how people really care about their characters that they've built. They spent hours reading all the rules and deciding the best way to build them and all the spells they needed and the best armor and they've played in real life for two years and like written stories about them and poems and drawn pictures. Like they get really, really invested and that's when nerd fights happen. But also like, I don't want to totally throw the, the, the rule, the game, the true gamers, but the storytellers too. Cause like, even when it's a rules light thing, like when you're really, really invested in that character, a nerd fight can take the form of just like, well, I don't think my character would feel that way. No, they do, because, you know, your sister just died, and you should be upset. No, I'm not upset. But you should be, because it has to for the story to work. Well, you're wrong, Flemeth, you know, or whatever. <laughs> um, so, um, it's a huge barrier, and I'm, but I want you to be aware of it and understand where it comes from. Uh, as, hopefully, this all leads to new D&D &D groups being formed, that's one of those things you have to be kind of aware of, and also aware of like, no, I don't like this, I'm not gonna play with these people anymore. You know, it's just like any group activity. Like, some people don't play the game the way you wanna play the game. Like, I'm so difficult to please, like, I can't play with anybody except for people I've played with for like, 15 years. Like, I, I, I like to DM and play with new people, and like introduce them, because that's really fun for me. But like, actually, when it's time for me to play, and someone's like, hey, my boyfriend's running a game, and I'm like, really? Yeah, we're gonna like be pirates, and uh, okay. No, and uh, uh, so, and so, 
yeah, so that's just something to be aware of. Be aware of it. It's a thing. Do not be afraid of it. It's okay. Um, okay. And also, as you guys are entering into this new land of this pastime, because I got really view. I keep using the word pastime. I need to find a better term for it. But um, there's something I really want you guys to be aware of, and of that gatekeepers. There are people who are going to want to keep you out. Because this always happens with any entrenched anything, but definitely, you know, white male nerd, this is our thing, get out of here, mm -hmm. you know, or basically they'll tell you like, well, you, you oh, you want to play 5th edition D&D? Well, 3.5 was way better, you're dumb if you like 5th <laughs> edition. Or right another thing like, oh, you want to play 3.5? You're dumb if you don't want to play 5th, like, it's all this like gatekeeping nonsense where they want to say, oh, well, you're not a real, you're not really playing it, you're not doing it right. It's only, it's only right if you do it the way that I do it. And even if, but even if you did it the exact same way that I'm doing it right now, uh, that's still not right. Because you're not like me, so get out. So basically, that I hate gatekeeping. So be aware of it, but do not accept it anywhere you encounter it. Okay, no one gets to tell you how you can do this, all right? Like, like you write a note for yourself that says, I do what I want to do, like uh, Ron Swanson, <laughs> and that, that's it. Like, there, like especially because there's so, much, like, there's so many role-playing games, so many ways you can try it, so many systems, so many cool ways. And like I said, we kind of talked about the top. At its root, it is just storytelling. They can't keep you out of it. <laughs> like, it is your thing. Like, you, as humans, you get to do it. The end. All right. Uh, and, but it's really going to come down to that. Like, like as people get weirdly territorial about like what is the right system, and more troublingly, like the right way to play. And this is going to. And I bring this up especially for like new players, because most likely when you play for the first time, you're going to be playing with people who've played more than you. Um, and most time, that's awesome because uh, new play, like old players, like we like are really really great because they want to like help the new player and show them how it works and like explain things but even very subtly you'll start to see that like well you know you really shouldn't be using that battle axe <laughs> why this battle axe is awesome like my father gave it to me <laughs> but you're a bard you're not you're not proficient with the battle axe, giving you minus two to your hit score, and that means you're not as efficient as you could be. You're not going to hit, and you're a bard anyway. They're not a combat class. Why are you doing that? Like, it like it very quickly slides into madness. <laughs> um, and I mean, like when I say it like that, it sounds ridiculous. But trust me, I've had life and death conversations <laughs> about these things. Um, so that like, you should like you should do what's fun for you. Okay, if, as you start playing, you may realize, like, I'm a power gamer. They're right. This is foolish. Give me the lightning rapier. You know, that's obviously better for me. But if what is fun for you is for your character wants to tote around, like your bard wants to tote around your dad's battle axe, and that's fun for you, do it. Like, that's awesome. And then if you want to, like, put strings on it and play it like it's a mandolin, that's even better. That's great. Um, so... So it's like, don't let people keep you out. Don't let people put gates on what is fun and what is the best way and what is the optimal way to do things or play. Because it is play. It is game. It is storytelling. It is fun. So ignore all that. Okay. You may find it difficult, but I just wanted to say it right off the top. That don't let other people dictate to you how you play a game. <laughs> like, I know it's, it's how, uh, I'm laughing at myself as I say it, but don't let people dictate to you. Like, if it's fun for you, then do it that way. I mean, uh, and we'll get into this more later. Like, obviously there are exceptions to this rule. Like, if what is fun for you is to stab everyone's, uh, everyone else's character while they're asleep, that is not okay. <laughs> that is not a cool move for you to make. Please don't do that. Unless you're really clever. Unless it's really funny when you do it. <laughs> then that's fine. <laughs> okay, so now I'm going I'm to real quick show you some links do some free stuff and some cheap stuff and then some kind of expensive stuff just are easy ways for you to get access to uh, 
some of this like toy rules type stuff. I'll run through that real quick. Eh. Okay, so so mainly we're talking about D and D, but short history lesson. During the third edition of Dungeons and Dragons, it was a pretty cool edition in my opinion. I am H O. <laughs> but another system arose by a rival competitor called Pathfinder, and it is awesome. <laughs> Most important for you, however, the entire system is free online. And yes, it is a bit daunting for you guys who are new to navigate all this information. I know, but it is 100, this is something where like the new DMs, like the next class I'm gonna do is just for DMs. Like this is something that's a resource for DMs and they can walk you through as players. But the whole system is online for free. Like all the monsters, all the classes, all the weapons, all the spells, all the everything about setting, everything. The entire thing is free online. So you can get into, and it's a great system. Like I'm kind of into fifth edition now just because it's, I'm always about the new shiny thing. Uh, but Pathfinder, big thumbs up, five stars. It is super fun and it's been out for four or five years now, a little bit more. So there's tons of stuff and most of it is online for free, okay? Um, so, and it is, it is, it is basically just a, another flavor of d and It's the same sort of thing, elves and wizards and stabbing people. It's the same base system, essentially. You roll dice, you do things, it's cool. Uh, okay. Another one real quick. Just a quick shout out for Obsidian Portal, which I need to log in so I can show you a little more. Sorry, I should have done this before. Uh, this is a resource where you can create uh, campaigns, like keep all the information for your camp. Eh, come on, what you doing? All right. Uh, where you can create pages for your campaigns, where you keep all the information for your characters together. You can like all the characters that are in the game and get little pictures of them. And you can have forums so you can plan out your adventures in between. Or you can play the games in between. That's a whole other session. We'll talk about that. Uh, you can also, what's cool about this one, my guys, because this one set is set in kind of a 1920s uh, time period. Uh, they, we've made little newspapers for every adventure. And then one of them did like a, a radio transcript, which is cool. Like, I think, and, so that's just something, this is more, it's more for Dungeon Masters, this is another like, there's lots of cool, this is also free for you guys to use online as well. Okay, here's some stuff you can buy to recommend to you. Okay, this is the Dungeons and Dragons starter set. Okay, it is basically a box. It comes with pre-made characters, so you don't have to make characters. It comes with dice. It comes with an adventure. It takes you from level one to level four, and I give it a thumbs up. Like a lot in in a lot of starters adventures, they give you kind of like a really basic adventure that's fine. This is like a like a, a full like adventure. It's actually pretty fun. Like I actually played. Have you played it? Before? Yeah, I, uh, that's how I actually got into D and D. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's a, it's a little generic. I will say that, but it's like the right kind of generic. You're like, oh yeah, I'm fighting goblins, and oh, there's a dwarf in danger. I have to save him. You know, like that kind of stuff. So. Big thumbs up, and it's only like 15, 20 bucks. Because they, they purposely made it cheap. And it's one of those, you don't have to buy anything else. It's got all the rules you need, and it's perfect for like new groups, because you can say, okay, I'm the elf, I'm the fighter, I'm this, you're the, you're the dungeon master, let's do it. And it's, it's very on rails, it's very easy, that kind of thing. Like, I definitely recommend it for once we start forming some of these new groups. Uh, there's also another one for Pathfinder. Starter box. <coughs> Wait, there, there's this called the beginner box. It's okay. yeah, if any of you have any interest in all the free Pathfinder stuff, they also have a beginner box. It's kind of the same deal where you get pre made characters and an adventure and get you started and then you can jump right in. Okay. And just to give a shout out to local businesses, uh, if you've got one that's going to walk in and browse around, 
and stuff is uh, Techies Games uh, right, right on campus, right across from Myers and the Lions parking lot, and Dragon Star. They're still over next to uh, Johnny's, right? They haven't moved yet. Okay. Okay. The, though they, their main focus is minis and card games, right? Yeah, it's yeah. mostly Magic and like uh, Warhammer. Yeah, which I, I get. That's totally a big money because big money maker for them. Because like like I said, D and D, like you buy one book and you're basically like you're good. You don't need a whole lot of stuff, other stuff because it's all extraneous. Um, but yeah, so that's that's what's kind of interesting to me is like, and I'm, I'm hoping more people will come and watch the video and all this kind of stuff. Is like there's this weird, like this is forgotten lore. Like it has not been transmitted. There's some sort of drop off point from my generation to like younger nerds. And so I'm excited to transmit the forgotten lore. Uh, okay, so, last thing. Is uh, The Adventure Begins, which is just a uh, Q&A. Let's just talk about stuff. Yes, Michael? Um, using miniatures. Uh-huh. I'm very bad at that. Is there like a good way to um, control like a setting or um, a good way to like print out a sort of grid? Um, sure. Place? Well, like a good place to print out a grid or do you just want a cheap grid? Uh, if you want the cheapest of grids, here's a pro tip. Uh, you go down to the craft store and you get, it's, it's like a big cardboard thing. It's used for quilting? I think mm -hmm. it's literally like a giant, it covers this entire table and it's five by five grids. Oh, nice. Like it's huge. And it's, I think they're like $4 or something ridiculous like that. But these, like I bought these like probably 15 years ago and I'm still using them. Um, but, but also they have the nice like mats that you can draw on with your, uh, your dry erase markers. They're only like, on Amazon, they're like $10 a piece for like a decent size mat. And then you can just draw on it and erase it and draw on it and erase it. I recommend those. But there's tons of free minis that you can just print out if you have access to a printer, which I don't anymore. Um, but like just get cardstock and then you print them out and cut them out and make basically really cheap free minis. Because like you see that all these, like these few minis, that these are all the minis I have. And every time I run a game, people are like, well, I guess I'll be the Reaper. You know, I'll be the Nazgul, and I'll be the Badger. Just because, like, well, because, like, minis are, like, they're like a huge money pit. Like, and because, like I said, you buy the book, and you basically, you just need the power of your imagination. And then you don't need to buy, I mean, these are fun. Like, I like to buy toys like everybody else. And they're cool toys. But I'm kind of, I'm, I'll get hit the age where I'm past retail therapy a little bit of this nature. Uh, so, like, you notice, like, all my, like, these are all my enemies for just different color tokens, which this was just a bag of, um, like, fit aquarium beads that I bought for, like, $6. I got some poker chips. I want to be like, it's a column! Now it's a column on fire! You know, like, <laughs> because that's what's cool about it, because it's ultimately just storytelling with your imagination. Like, once you agree, and I know all my players are sick of seeing these. But oh, it's the thing. Like, I literally, like, there's, I've had epic battles on this same, on this, over and over and over. Like, this has been like, this is a tavern, it's a tavern. Now it's a submarine. You know, like, and they're like, okay. But hopefully through my description, they are transported in their imagination. But yeah, is that kind of? Oh, yeah, totally. Okay. Questions? Yes, Beth. I was thinking about the storytelling aspect, and I wonder when you're actually sitting at the table and it's your turn, I know that there's like your actions and you're saying this is what I'm going to do. Do you speak in first person and say, I am doing this, or That's a great I question. did this? How do people talk? That's a great question. Um, it's interesting because a lot of people do it different ways. And some people, like I'm not this way at all, but some people are very are sticklers about it like they always want to talk as their character in the third person like mm -hmm. like like Wexler Jarvis says you know like mm -hmm. or like but some people just say like my guy does this mm -hmm. and what's interesting generally around any given table you'll have multiple people doing different things mm -hmm. so like don't don't feel like there's a convention of how you have to say it for it to be a proper mm -hmm. like 
because uh, generally when you're around a table, like uh, I'm kind of going to talk about this more when we start when I have the DM meeting, but you definitely a good DM and a good group, you're going to have sort of a natural like a covenant that you kind of strike of like this, like we're all playing this game together, we all want to have fun, and so there's going to be a natural sort of oh well, this is how we do it, like it's a and because some DMs are very up on speaking out of character versus in character because like. Because it sometimes it's very important for the type of game to know, like, if you're saying, like, well, I stab him. You're like, wait, did you just stab him? Because cause if you were just kind of saying that, like, just Beth saying that, and you're just being annoyed with the villain du jour, mm -hmm. like, oh, I'm just going to stab him. But that's very different from, like, your character says, like, I stab him. Like, that's like, you push the button. And it, so, some, so some DMs can, like, if it's, like, a really tense situation, like, okay, for the next... Like for this encounter, you, like if you are speaking out of character, you need to make that clear mm -hmm. because I don't want to make a mistake, you know. And also because like if it's a, like cause sometimes like most most D and D games especially really lends itself to like a lot of like comedy and like it really can't be that serious if we're if a minotaur is about to punch us, <laughs> you know. It can't be that dire most of the time, but sometimes it is. Like sometimes like you've chased this minotaur for three weeks because he killed your father. And it's a tense moment and the DM has worked, like maybe the DM's worked really hard to like make it tense and make it really like, oh, you know, like make it like really impactful because like, because most DMs are like, like me, like, you know, me like frustrated novelists or whatever. They really want you to feel it. They really want it to land and be a good scene for you. And so by people over there saying like, well, I'm gonna get some chips. You might want any chips? <laughs> like literally the DM would be like, and the Minotaur pulls off his eye patch and you see he has chips, do you want any chips? <laughs> like it totally destroys the mood. And that's really the only time that that sort of, are you in character? Are you out of character? Mm -hmm. Like the actual how you say it, it's really not important. Mm -hmm. Like, and I think you'll, you will naturally find through playing what feels right for you. Because what's really fascinating is most people start out as very like, my character does this. My character walks forward and says, please let us come into the inn. You know, or my character picks up the goblin skull and kicks it. You know, or whatever. Or my character finds a taco and is very excited. <laughs> but then as they grow more invested, invested in the characters and the more they know about them, it becomes more like, I'm so upset. Where's my taco gone? <laughs> Father, you know, like they won't even realize that transition moment where they just start speaking as their character, mm -hmm. and especially like in the groups I played with, they're all actors anyway, so it's a very, it's very easy to watch that little like, oh, like people and people have gotten legit, legit emotional <laughs> about stuff that has happened to their characters, like, like not always like, man, the gym screwed me over, I'm upset, just like, man, my mother. She betrayed me. I can't believe she did that. You know, like, and stuff like that. Or, he blew up our airship. You know, like, like things, like these imaginary, that's what the best part of it is. Me and Mike Smith had this, like, like I've talked about this for years, like, that's what's wonderful about it, how you can invest in these imaginary things that are totally imaginary. Only six people on the planet know about them, but you're totally invested. So, yeah. Okay. Well, it's going to give me an opportunity to ramble. <laughs> yeah, Michael. Bit of a follow-up. Uh, sorry, bit of a follow-up question. Mm -hmm. uh, Meta gaming. Mm. When to do it? It's uh, an advanced topic. Should I do it? When should I? <laughs> well, when, so, when should I do it? Should I do it? <laughs> okay. So, meta gaming. Okay. So you're all sitting around a table. And you're and some people are very, and some people care more about this than others. It's very important to distinguish. Metagaming is when like, like you have all your characters around, and so you're fighting this badger, okay? But all the characters, this is the first time they've ever fought a badger. For all they know, it's the most fiendish beast in the land. But you, but Michael knows, this is Michael's character, Michael knows because he's read the book, that badgers are weak against fire. But his character doesn't know that. Mm. So 
by, if he says, I'm going to use a fire spell, no reason, mm -hmm. that's metagaming. Mm -hmm. Because he's using, the character is using knowledge that the character doesn't have. Okay, and that's kind of a very basic example, but it can get very, like, they can get really esoteric and fascinating from there. Because there's lots of like, okay, we're in, we're in a pit, and the spikes are coming in, and we're about to be crushed from above, and, okay, it's only an hour into the game. There's no way the DM's killing us all an hour into the game. There must be a solution. There must be a way out. There's got to be a, tr a trigger to stop the trap. There's got to be a way to teleport out of here. Something. That's metagame. Like, your, the char there's no way the characters could know that. Mm -hmm. This is supposed to be a perilous moment uh, when they cannot escape. Um, so that's metagaming, because you know the DM, you think, at least you think you know, mm -hmm. the DM wouldn't do that to you. So, obviously. Well, then can you really that, avoid that, metagaming to some extent? You, that, and that's the answer. To some extent, you cannot avoid it, okay? Just by the very nature of, like, a halfling rogue, a high elf priest, a minotaur barbarian, and a, and a princess deciding to travel together to fight evil, there's already metagaming there. By you, by just coincidentally, the characters that you all decided to play deciding to stick together, that's a little bit of metagaming. <laughs> like, but that's, but that kind of stuff is okay. Uh, and that's one of the, like, to, to actually answer the question, which is difficult for me, I apologize. No, no, that was no, uh, I'm saying I ramble all the time and I have to circuitously get back to my point. Um, but uh, the answer is like that's one of those you have to get with your DM and your group to feel like what level is okay. Like most of the time, like like the example you had before, where Michael knows that badgers are weak against fire and he's going to use a fire spell. Most of the time, like like most players would be like, "Hey, is this okay? Is this metagaming?" And most of them might be like, no, it's fine. Like, it's just, a, it's, like, this is not, the badger is not my main villain. It's just a random thing for you to fight. I would view it as, like, maybe your character just happened to hear that one time. Or there's an easy explanation for why. Or maybe just, like, I just used a fire spell because I only had a fire spell. And lo and behold, it worked really well. Thumbs up, everybody. High fives, you know, kind of thing. Uh, but it'd be very different if, like, the badger was like, no, this is the ultimate badger. You can't know that. No one knows that. He's the only badger on the planet. It's impossible. Um, so it's, it's, like I said, it's about, you have to really communicate with the DM and the group just to feel what everyone's comfortable with. But generally, it's, uh, you obviously have to do it to some extent. You, sh you should only do it, you shouldn't do it when it's just to your own advantage, if that makes sense. If it's making something easier for the party or easier for the story, yeah. If it's something that just like, oh, this screws over everybody, but it really helps me, I probably shouldn't do it. But that's just kind of a good guideline for everything. <laughs> Questions? Yes, ma'am. So what, <clears throat> what resources are out there for brand new players who want to go ahead and, go ahead and, and have their own game? Like, I'm in, I want a vampire game. I'm all this there is. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh -oh. Uh, then, but you've got no, but you know nothing. Like you got nothing. If starting from zero, uh, if like if, like Kevin used that example, like I want to play a vampire game, then obviously start with your Google foo, like just Google vampire role playing games. There's several that are awesome, and just find one. And this is this is kind of stinks because there isn't an easy like like with D and D. D and D is the Coke of this world. It's like oh here's a just a box. It's twenty dollars. There you go. Plug and play. You're ready to go. Um, but instead, but vampire it requires more research, where you would have to like, okay, I'm gonna buy this vampire book and be forewarned, roleplay books is expensive. Mm. They're generally about 40, 50 bucks. Uh, a lot of times, but though there has been a lot of big movement now to make ebooks of them a lot cheaper, PDFs, that kind of thing. But also talk to your nerd friends. Most of them have, if not the current edition. Like I know me and Steven will just buy roleplay books just to read them with no intent to ever play them. Just because we're in, like we're that kind of nerd that just are interested. Um, so you like 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 I know I I know Steven has a ton of vampire books. And you'd be like here, and you kind of read through them. But definitely like like use the people that you know that have played them before. 
But like, if you're in, a, but if if you're in like a desert wasteland, then you're basically just gonna have to order some off Amazon and just read them and try to figure it out, which unfortunately isn't super, super, um, isn't gonna be super um, good. <laughs> <laughs> So what I would recommend in that scenario, where you just don't have access to anyone who can really guide you, is get the book, but ultimately, use it like a salad bar. If anything you don't, don't understand, ignore it. Find the parts of it that are cool and that you like, because ultimately when you sit down and play with people, you're entering into a covenant. You're agreeing, like, we're agreeing that this is how our game works. And if our game works via there's no dice, there's no nothing, we're just telling this story together, Awesome. Or if we agree that this game works on coin flips, awesome. Like, just pick the salad bar parts that you want and then use that. And just anything that don't, doesn't work, ignore it. Throw it away. Or wait to figure it out later. Like, it's, it's all good. Don't, don't, don't be your own gatekeeper. Let yourself in. Yeah, yeah, brother. Yeah. Uh, cool. Uh, anybody else? Questions? I and mean, we have the room. Uh, I'm effectively done. We have the room for like another like hour, essentially. Uh, so we can just kind of chill and talk about stuff. If you guys don't have any more official questions or anything. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about the Pathfinder website. Now, if you were going to create a character, do you go into like, you go into the categories of classes and then mm -hmm. does that tell you kind of like what you could yeah. do? And does it tell you? The bard can't also do this because he's a bard. Mm -hmm. So there are certain things you can't you can't just put together whatever you want in a character. Yeah, in that in that kind of system, no, okay. because that that system system is very much about defined roles. Right. Um, and when, if you start wandering in that website, you you are very quickly going to get a little overwhelmed mm -hmm. because you're going to be like, okay, classes, bard. What is this? You know, like, it's, it's just, it's a lot all at once. I honestly like, when I, when I get a new system, even now, like, I'm, I'm an expert. Like, I still like getting the book, just because it's much more easy to, like, digest. I'm like, oh, I'm just reading the book. Oh, that's weird. Oh, okay, page. Oh. You, you know, um, yeah, but D&D is very, like, this class does this, cannot do this. And most classes have like unique things that only they mm -hmm. can do. Like bards, to use an example, like their magic is based around music and being able to perform and they have cool, unique abilities where they can just randomly know things. Mm -hmm. Like just because they're bards and they're telling stories and they like collect stories. So they have this unique role that they can make that only bards can do. Like what's, like just roll to see if I know. Like anything that the DM could ever, DM hates, some DMs really hate bards for this reason. He's like, okay, you're going to the secret cave of ultimate secrecy. <laughs> no one's ever been there. I'm gonna roll to see if I know. Roll to 20. <sighs> you know that the cave of ultimate secrecy houses a, a werewolf ninja hybrid. <laughs> Try to act surprised. You know, uh, that kind of thing. Okay. Cool. Other questions? Yes, Mike. Um, <laughs> back and forth. Uh, um, so one of my favorite parts of the game is just creating different characters. Mm -hmm. Is do you have any things with like um, creating characters from races that aren't um, published? Yeah, because like if I'm saying like, oh, I want to do an Afriti character sure. or a Chain Devil. Or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, basically I'm gonna cut the rest of you guys loose for a second, and me and my talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, um, there's two answers. Um, a lot of times the game itself will eventually put out the official rules for that race. Mm -hmm. Like Pathfinder, they have every race you could ever potentially want, because they've just published them all. D D is still kinda new, so they haven't quite done all that. Then what you would do in that case, you would get with your your DM, your dungeon master, and say, I want to make an Afridi. Let's work together and decide how an Afridi would work in our game. Like what? And there's actual rules for it, like in the monster manual, but even if you don't want to get into that, you can say, okay, I think it'd be cool if an Afridi could like manifest fire at will. And he'd be like, hold up, that's too powerful. 
and you would, you know, you would work back and forth like, well, I think they should get pluses to charisma because they're so cool. And he'd be like, mm, you just want to make a sorcerer. You know, like, and there'd be lots of like, most, most DMs are just cruel. They know that you players just want something that you're gonna, it's gonna cause a problem later. But yeah, that's how you would do it. Uh, but if you're just, if you're just making them for fun, then you would just like say, ah, I'll just, just kind of decide what they can do. Um, you know, so, but that's when you wind up with, like I said, with ninja werewolf hybrids that I've got a 16 strength and a 95 dexterity. I can turn into shadow, and I also have a hybrid wolf form. That, you know, like, I have a rod that summons Dracoliches for me to ride, and yeah, it's all good. Yeah, it's, it's all about like what, whatever, whatever bound of reality you want to break in your world. That is totally cool. Uh, anybody else? Questions? Yeah. So I have a question. How do you find people to play with? Well, that's that's the tough one. I'm hoping that the Facebook group, if nothing else, will start, like, because I'm hoping, because the next class I'm going to do is just for DMs. And I think that's the best way, because for new players, it's really hard when you don't know all the rules and you feel like everyone else knows. And if getting new DMs with new players together, I think it's going to be the key. Um, because it's, it's weird, like, being a DM has become, like, you are the fossil fuel of nerddom. You are this vanishing resource. And I'm terrible because I'm so eager to like chase the new shiny thing. Like I'll be running a game, and then someone's like, "Hey, we want to play." And I'm like, "Yeah, okay, y'all run a game for you too." Yeah, yeah. And then people are like, "Hey, we want you to play in this game." Yeah, I can do that. Okay. Yeah, all right. <laughs> hey, we want to play. Oh, yeah, that would. Yeah, okay. I can... All right. No, I literally got into a situation where I was running two games in parallel dimensions, but it was the same game, so I was recycling a lot of stuff until the parties decided to split, thanks. Um, I was also playing another game, running another game. But the problem is, like, the more you do that, like, especially because, like, me, I'm always trying to, like, tell stories and stuff. Like, you split your resources and to where it's not fun and you're not doing a good job and it just becomes exhausting. So I'm trying to, like, restrict myself. Like, I'm just running a game. Because that's very, it's fun for me. And it's, main, it's fun for the players. But the more I try to like split myself, because I want to, because I want more people to play, and I love, because new players are so much fun, because when you play with it, like, like people who've played a lot, they do things the same way, because they know how the game is played. Like, new players always surprise you with like, well, I'm going to go, can I go talk to the cow? <laughs> uh, yeah, or, yeah, yes, go, to, uh, I mean, well, I'm a ranger, I can talk to beasts. Yes, let's go talk to the cow, let's go talk to them right now. What? Oh, it's time. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know, just like unique solutions to things and unique like ways of approaching problems and all that kind of thing. Like I ran a, I ran a new game with sort of kind of new people where they played four games in a campaign of D&D, &D, no combat. They found a peaceful resolution to every encounter. They were able to escape or work it out with, and it became a goal for them. I was like, look, if you can make it, because I had basically built this like module, if you can make it to the end of this town without fighting anything, I will give you like a bonus, like a thousand extra experience points kind of thing. And they, they pulled it off. I was very impressed. And as this was in the parallel dimension game, the other team were like, kill everything, <laughs> salt the earth. Do they have gold? Kill it. <laughs> and, it's, and it was really interesting to me because in D&D, &D, you're like, well, they'll go here and then they'll fight this. And when someone's like, oh, we don't want to fight them. Oh, well, it really like made me have to be more creative and think of different things for them to do. And like, oh, well, well do you want to like, do you want to get a drink? You know, do you want to go get some pancakes? <laughs> yeah, let's do that. Yeah, it was really, really fun. Um, I don't remember the original question now. How do you meet people to play? How do you meet people? How, 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 what do you mean? I don't know. Um, you know like, go back in time to 1998. No, um, uh, when I was in college. Um, no, but I'm really hoping that the, this, the Facebook group at the very least will become a hub right. where people can, like new DMs are going to want new players because you're not any good. You're not good any good without the other. So hopefully, and then hopefully I can act as a resource to like, train up new DMs or just help, like help like sit in and help people and help people make characters and help people DM and all that kind of stuff. Um, because 
Like Techies and Dragonstar are awesome, but Dragonstar is very focused on card games and minis because that's how they're making their money, and that's awesome. Like you go in there and ask for some D and D stuff, and they're like, "What? Oh, I guess it's in the back under those tumbleweeds or whatever." <laughs> and Tykes is on the other end, where Tykes is like the uber elite. <laughs> like there's like, and I love Tykes. Like they have so many awesome old games, and like yeah, I love that place. But it's a, it's it's daunting. It's very daunting to be players. Um, so hopefully it'll be a good thing. Yay! So, but yeah. But that's the, but we kind of took before you came late. Sorry. Michael, we talked a lot about like <laughs> barriers, and that is that is the one we didn't really get into. It's just hard. You need people to play with. And it's hard to find those people. <laughs> so, so yeah. Shrug emoji. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully this will be a good resource. I hope. That is my that is my hope. My goal. Anybody else before we? Oh yeah. Um. For me, one of the barriers of entry has always been just like the minutia and all like the mm -hmm. tiny math that you have to mm -hmm. know and you have to figure out all the rules and mm -hmm. you know kind of like how the system works. I, did, I get up getting very frustrated, especially once I start getting more and more abilities. Mm -hmm. and I, I mean, uh, for example, my character in that game you were just talking about, well, she was a, a witch and the spells just started getting so overwhelming. There's just, like, mm -hmm. too much to know and too much math to keep up with. What would you suggest uh, for a newer player to be able to keep up with that? Sort of sure. Thing? Uh, one thing right off the bat is finding the system that's the right level of rules crunch mm -hmm. for you is really great. Um, I actually really like the new 5th edition. They really streamline a lot of the math and just make it more, much quicker to calculate. We're not sitting there forever. But definitely for spellcasters, because I used to not play spellcasters a lot for that very reason, where I was like, oh, what do I... I, don't, I, think it's so fun. I know. Uh, <laughs> Why is it so for me, making spell cards, yeah. which they sell, they sell them. Uh, but really, it's more fun to get index cards and just make them. Like and like, especially when you prepare spells. Like, here's what I can do, and they have little descriptions and all the math already there for you. That was what was really helpful to me. But I really think at its root, it's just finding the system that is the right level of rules crunch. Mm -hmm. Like fate would be great yeah. because everything is. Uh, I think it's D twelves. Like and it's very flexible. Like you, like part of fate. The first time you sit down to play fate, you build the world. You and the players, you build the world together. Like you say, we want the world to be like this, and then everyone agrees, and then you build the characters together, and then you kind of agree how all the like I want it, like I want to be magic. Well, how does magic work? This is how it works. Yay, we all agree. You know, and it's it's super cool. And just allowing yourself to, which some people like who love all the rules crunch, are like, no, it's not, it's not real enough for me, which is dumb. I'm definitely gonna like, whatever, whatever just makes it feel right and work for you and stuff. That, that, that's what I would recommend. Questions? I'm here for you, for your resource, for your question answer. Okay, then I, I'll wrap things up. All of you for attending the first, the home room, you get dice. <laughs> you also get 250 experience points. <laughs> Make sure you write your name on the attendance so I can award it to you in the group. So everyone who did not come will know they did not get their experience points. Uh, but yeah, have some dice. Take as many or as few as you want. Feel free to dig around for the pretty ones. <laughs> And thank you all for coming. The first D and D school. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm gonna turn off this camera. Boop.